All right, so we're going to take a look at factors affecting solubility. So these are actually pretty important. So the idea so far is we've dissolved salt in water, but now what if that water is altered? Okay, so what if it already has stuff in it? If it has a common ion present, because we've already done that with buffers. What if it has, if the acid or base levels change? And we can see this quite a bit. In fact, I'll show you this in class when I combine two things, add some base, and it completely shifts away from, uh, from insoluble to soluble. So I'm going to focus on the, the all, I'm going to show you all four. And I'm going to show you which ones are important. Um, the last two you're going to see less of, but you have to kind of recognize them. So first of all, the common ion effect. If there is a common ion present of the solubility that you have, this will always decrease solubility. So common ion always decreases solubility. The pH effects can increase or decrease solubility. You can do both of those. So pH effects are the big one. So those are the two big ones. The ones that are a little bit less, we'll still talk about them, but you're gonna run into them less or they're kind of, I don't think you'll be tested on them at this level, is the complex ions, complex ion formation which is always an increase in solubility. And amphoterism, which is kind of the same thing. It's kind of all three of the above combined together uh, where you basically you can, uh, you're gonna get the addition of acids and or bases, basically the substance can act as an acid or a basis. So acids and bases are both uh, effective. So all three of those kind of are consumed in the last one, okay, or, or assumed in the last one. So let's take a look at common ion effect first because it always decreases solubility. So one of the ions in your salt, so this is the situation. One of the ions in your salt is already dissolved in the solution is at equilibrium the equilibrium will shift to the left and solubility will decrease. So if we look at our basic, the one that we started with, AgCl solid creates Ag plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. So if we have those two things in solution, okay. What happens if I try to dissolve AgCl in a solution, in a salt water solution. So if I already have, so when I have, when I say NaCl, this we have to recognize is strong. Meaning that I have NaCl, I have Na plus, and I have Cl minus present. So what we have to recognize is whenever we're talking about solubility or common ion, those are strong solutions. So those things are already in solution. So what do we expect to happen? Well, if I increase the concentration of the chloride, this is Le Chatelier's, right? If I increase the concentration of the chloride, we are gonna see a shift back to the left. So a shift back to the left does what to solubility? So if we think about solubility, what I wanna say is, okay, so this is what I'm starting with. I create this whole little setup, this right here. If I gain more AgCl, right? Like I do in this example, I'm producing AgCl. I'm going to see more solid form and it's going to be less soluble. Okay. If the thing is pulled to the right, I'm going to lose more AgCl and we would see with our naked eye that that would disappear. Okay. So if I shift it this way, we're going to see an increase in solubility. So shifting this way, increasing the amount of this present means it's a decrease in solubility. And so let's take a look at that example. So calculate the molar solubility of calcium fluoride. Okay, so we've actually already done this calcium fluoride calculation. Yeah, so we did the calcium fluoride in our last video, in our last example. So in pure water, we saw that the calcium fluoride solubility was equal to 1.1 
times 10 to the minus three molar. So that was the, uh, that was the molar solubility of our substance. And we also figured out that the, uh, the gram solubility, so this is molar, the gram solubility was equal to 0 0.086 grams per liter. That's what I saw for the pure water molar solubility. And again, that was the calculation that we did right here. Okay, so if you need a reminder on how to do that, it was on page 15. Okay, so with that said, what happens with, so here we have calculate the molar solubility of calcium fluoride, if it also contains, so this is what's in solution now. I recognize this CaNO3 as a strong electrolyte, meaning I have calcium two plus and two nitrates. So if I start with 0 0.010 molar of this, I should have 0 0.010 molar of this and two times that, so 0 0.020 molar of that, okay? So this is already in solution, this and the nitrate, but I don't really care about the nitrate. Why do I not care about the nitrate? Because again, this is a equilibrium problem, so let's write out our uh, equilibrium expression. CaF2 as a solid is in equilibrium with calcium two plus aqueous and two F minus. terrible. Let's try this one more time. There we go. There we go. Initial, oops. Initial change equilibrium. This is going to be in molarity. And what do I know? I don't care about the solid because that's all gone or it's, it's all not an equilibrium expression. Oh, that's right. Speaking of equilibrium expression, I have to write that out. So my KSP is equal to the concentration of calcium two plus times the concentration of F minus squared. And I know my KSP from before was 5.3 times 10 to the negative nine. And so now I need to figure these two values out and then square them. So which do I know? I know that I start with no, uh, I know that I start with 0 0.010 molar calcium two plus and zero fluoride. Because again, it's coming from the strong electrolyte that I have present, that's how much I start with. So again, this is just more complex because I'm starting with some value. I know that I'm gonna gain X amount of this and two X amount of the fluoride, okay? So that means that I'm gonna have 0 0.010 plus X, which we can assume X is tiny because X is a very small number. And we're just gonna say that X gets dwarfed by the 0 0.01 that's already present. And this becomes two X. So there, I have my equilibrium values already present and I can plug them in. So calcium is point. 0, 0.010 0 molar, and my F is equal to 2X. And now we can do the solution of this. So what we end up with is, so focusing on this, uh, 5.3 times 10 to the negative nine is equal to 0 0.010 0 molar times four X squared. Okay, well, I guess that's gonna get rid of the parentheses. Okay. Divide both sides by and then multiply that out. And what you end up with is 0.04x squared. 0.04x0 squared is equal to 5.3 times 10 to the minus nine. Smaller. There we go. Divide both sides by 0.04. We end up with x squared is equal to uh, 1.3 times 10 to the minus nine, 1.3 times 10 to the minus nine. Take the square root of both sides. 
x is equal to 3.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so what do we know? So what I know is the concentration of calcium 2 plus does not change. It's 0 0.010 molar. I know that the concentration of F minus is equal to two times X, which is gonna equal 7.3 times 10 to the minus four, okay? That means X, which is, so again, if this is my molar, this is my uh, ion solubility or ion concentration at equilibrium. Right. My X, which is equal to 3.6 times 10 to the minus four. This is my molar solubility. Is it, that's my molar solubility. So if we compare these numbers and I should say in 0 0.010 calcium two plus solution, my molar solubility was equal to 3.6 times 10 to the minus four molar. Okay. So, a little bit, so an order of magnitude less. And we can take this one step further and we can solve that. We can turn that into gram solubility. So if I take that 3.6 times 10 to the minus four uh, moles per liter times grams per mole, which is again, 78.07 grams per one mole, moles goes away. I'm left with 0 0.0 to eight grams per liter. So 0 0.028 grams per liter. Here we go. So we can see that the solubility has dropped by a quarter almost in the solution of 0 0.01 calcium. Okay, so solubility always decreases. Again, the idea is with calcium already present, it shifts it, it decreases the solubility. And because we're talking about X and X is the real thing that's stopping the dissolving, right? So if I have this and I only produce this many ions, we know that we have lost some of it, okay? So that's the value of X is what we're looking at. So what is the solubility of the same cadmium solution in 0 0.003 molar cadmium chloride? So again, the answer from above that we did at the end of last the last lecture. And same thing here, the, the two that I assigned you. So What's the solubility of these two things in the uh, solutions that we actually have present? Okay. Okay, good. So that is the common ion effect. That's the one you always decrease in solubility. pH effects are a little bit more confusing um, as they always tend to be, but let's take our calcium fluoride solution that we were just looking at. Equilibrium with calcium two plus aqueous and two F minus aqueous. And let's see what happens when I add an acid to this. So again, if I add acid, which is my acid, what's gonna happen? Well, the addition of H plus aqueous is gonna combine with one of those. So nothing is ever gonna interact with the solid because it needs to be in the same phase, okay? So is it gonna interact with the calcium or is it gonna act with the fluoride? It's gonna interact with the fluoride. And it will in fact interact with the fluoride, which is also aqueous. And so what do we make? H plus and F minus is gonna make us HF, okay? The important part here is this is an equilibrium. We'll recognize that this is a weak acid and that's an important part of it. And we're gonna talk about that as well. Again, weak acids, but what happens if this were a strong acid? Well, we're actually gonna see that in the next one. So this is a weak acid. That's fine. This forms as a weak acid. This, this side is preferred over 
this side, right? This would prefer to be the weak acid. So we are gonna get this. We are not really gonna have much of a reverse because this is forming a weak acid. So HF is gonna form. So by the formation of that HF, what that is, what we're actually seeing is we are seeing in decrease in the concentration of F minus. Because what we're really looking at is what's going on with this equilibrium. We don't really care about the formation of this, but we do care is this has turned into HF, meaning the F minus has actually decreased in concentration. So if we have a decrease in the concentration of F minus, that is equal to a shift in which direction. So if I lose something, we're gonna to shift towards the direction of the loss, shifts to the right. If this whole thing, if this solid shifts to the right, I am losing solid because I'm trying to create, I am creating more ions. So shifting that direction means that it is ultimately an increase in solubility. Okay, so we see an increase in solubility for this one when we add acid. So the first question is, does the acid or the base react with something present? Because if it reacts with something, how does it change the equilibrium? And ultimately the only equilibrium I care about is the one that actually is dealing with the solubility. Okay, what happens if I add base in the form of OH minus? That's always our base. What happens if I add base? Well, it's the same thing. My OH minus is gonna interact with something in solution. And in this case, it would have to interact with calcium two plus aqueous. This is gonna form calcium hydroxide. Aqueous. What do I know about calcium hydroxide? Well, unlike that, this is a not a weak, but this is a strong base. The fact that this is strong and this is neg that makes this negligible. So that's the conjugate, right? So if calcium hydroxide is strong, that makes the calcium a negligible acid. What does that mean? Our negligible base. What does that ultimately mean? That means that this process cannot occur. Because as soon as I form, think about it this way, as soon as I form a strong base, what's immediately going to happen? It's going to shift back in this direction and it's going to, uh, yeah, so this is immediately going to shift back in this direction because it's strong. It immediately wants to separate. So if I form something strong, it immediately separates back into its components. So this preferred direction is much greater and that is ultimately the prefer preferred side to be. So above here, this prefers to form. Calcium hydroxide doesn't form. Those are the preferred things. So ultimately, there is no change in concentration. So if there is no change in concentration, no delta, no change in concentration of calcium 2 plus. And therefore, no change in solubility. If that were weak, if that were if this were an ion or an iron fluoride compound, then yeah, we would see the base react and it would remove calcium from solution or iron from solution, it would remove the metal. But again, those are the things we have to determine when we're looking at pH and solubility. And so I can simplify this just a little bit. I'm gonna kind of just kind of skip over this whole chart here because we have kind of done that already, looking at like the the um, the strong acid and base salts and kind of identifying weak acids and bases. But ultimately trying to understand solubility and pH as you look at the ions in the KSP equation, that's the step, first step. If they're weak, again, we can identify if they're weak by looking at their conjugates. If they're a weak acid or base, they will react with acid or base added. Okay, I guess I should say with H plus and or H or OH minus. So it'll will react. Okay, so solubility will adjust accordingly. So you have to kind of be aware of those things. Okay, so. Lead chloride. So let's take a look at this. What happens if I add H plus to this? What happens if I add OH minus to this? Okay, so think about those two things and let's talk about those effects. How about if I have AGF and I add acid or base? What about 
iron hydroxide if I add acid or base. So we're going to talk about all of those. Okay. So how about this one here? Uh, silver iodide, barium fluoride, and AGBr. These are all sparingly soluble. Which of these salts is, salts is going to be more soluble in acidic solution? So we're going to take a look at that. Okay. All right. Will calcium hydroxide precipitate from a solution with a pH of 0.08? So this is kind of a new thing. I probably need a heading for it, but what happens if I start at a Q? When I ask whether a precipitate will form, what I'm really asking ultimately is, can I achieve an equilibrium? If I can achieve an equilibrium, then we are going to be able to form an equilibrium, okay? So will calcium hydroxide precipitate from a solution if the pH were that, and a solution is adjusted to a pH of, yeah, so sorry, I should say pH of 0.08 molar calcium chloride, which is strong, adjusted to a pH of this. So this is strong. So I can right away say CaCl2 as a solid is going to form calcium two plus and two Cl minus. So if I start with a solution of 0.08 molar, I guess this technically is aqueous, I'm gonna have 0.08 molar of this and I have 0.16 molar of that, right? Because there's twice as much. Okay, pH equal to eight means that we have two concentrations of value here. So this means that I have a concentration of H plus equal to 10 raised to the negative pH, which is equal to 10 raised to the negative eight. And the concentration of OH minus equal to uh, 10 raised to the negative six. We can just do our math works there. So we essentially, I have a beaker that contains all of these ions. Okay, I've got a beaker that contains every single one of these ions. So I have H plus equal 10 to the minus eight molar. I have concentration of OH minus equal to 10 to the minus six molar. I have calcium two plus equal to 0.08 molar. And I have concentration of Cl minus equal to 0.16 molar. Basically, I want to know was, does anything effing happen, happen here? And how we're going to do that is, again, we're going to write out our calcium hydroxide. We're going to write out our equilibrium as a solid. Is in equilibrium with calcium 2 plus aqueous plus 2OH minus aqueous. And what I want to know is, do I have enough here to shift it back? So I know that my calcium is 0.08 molar. And my hydroxide is 10 to the minus 6 molar. So the question is, does it shift it back in that direction? Because if it shifts it back in that direction, I'm going to get, a, uh, I'm going to get an equilibrium to form. So really, this is a question of K versus Q. So my K, which is equal to... Uh, let's see here, 6.5, I can look this up, 6.5 times 10 to the minus six. Well, what's the Q? So let's solve for Q. Q is equal to the concentration of calcium two plus, OH minus squared, right? And I already have those values. So 0 0.08 molar times 10 to the minus six molar squared. My Q, after I do that math, comes out to be 8.5 or 8 times 10 to the negative 14. So if I compare these two values, Q versus K. So right now, what do I know about Q? Q is less than K. So that means that I need, therefore, Q must increase to reach K, meaning in order for Q to increase, I need to increase the amount of products and I need to decrease the amount of reactants. And therefore that is a shift to the right and a shift to the right 
produces no solid whatsoever. In fact, I don't have any more solid to form. So what we don't, what we see is that that, that ultimately means that no precipitate, PPT is precipitate formed. Okay, so we have no precipitate formed in this case when we combine those two things together. Okay, all right. How about a 0.03 molar solution of lead nitrate adjusted to pH of 10? Will a precipitate form then? Okay. This is a really good question as well. Uh, this is a really complex equilibria, but it's kind of neat. So give this one a go. That's worth a try. It's a Q kind of question. All right. So I'm going to kind of breeze through these last two. The idea of a complex ion. So very simply, the idea of a complex ion is, first of all, what does a complex look like? Typically, we have a metal with some amount of positive charge, let's just say two plus, and it's going to combine together with what we call a ligand. A ligand is something with a pair of electrons, okay, instead of a negative charge. Again, we call this thing a ligand. And this ligand is going to create a bond with that metal. We are going to form a, basically, we're going to form a product. So we're going to form the metal bound with this uh, ligand, and it's going to have one positive charge because that's the overall addition of those two. In fact, this can happen again, plus another ligand, to form a second. So metal plus two ligands. Okay. Okay. This whole thing, by the way, is aqueous. This has been aqueous this whole time. What? Why does this matter? So we get all these really complex ligands that form all these really fancy things. Heme, hemoglobin is this ligand, uh, ligand and iron form complex that we actually have in our, in our blood. Um, so if we consider a weak base, what actually happens? So if I have some metal and it is a bunch of water molecules bound to it, uh, I don't know if I should tell you guys how this works, but there's a water molecule that's bound Here's another water molecule that's bound. And then there's six water molecules. If I introduce a NH3, it actually is a very strong, it has a very strong interaction with a lot of metals. And this is what happens. So it's going to create it's going to have a better job. It does get a better job than the water. So it's going to actually attach itself to the metal with that lone pair. And this pair of electrons is going to kick out that water. Okay. So two things happen. This is going to create a bond with this. And then immediately it's going to kick this water out. And so we're going to add this and we're going to subtract, we're going to subtract the water. So what this ends up with is what I have now is I have the metal with those five water molecules. Right? One, two, three, four, five. And now it also has an NH3 attached and oh, released, it released a water molecule. Okay. And this can actually happen again where another. NH3 can come out and it's going to kick off another one. So ultimately, what this is going to look like. In the end is this metal is going to have four water molecules, two NH3s, and it's going to kick out a second water molecule. Okay. Why does any of this matter? Okay. Well, what ultimately happened is this metal has attached NH3 and then another NH3. What does this mean in terms of the equilibrium? If I have a, the concentration of this metal ion is actually decreased because it is no longer just the metal that's dissolved, it's this one of these two species. This also means the concentration of these things that form the complexes like NH3, for example, also decreased because it's no longer NH3 alone, it is now bound to the metal, like in these cases. So what we see is 
these complex ions can actually form in solution. And they do so with really high, these things really do happen pretty frequently if you look at those KF values. So if I have a solution that contains silver and I introduce ammonia to it, we actually form this, it decreases the concentration of both of those. So what happens is ultimately these things right here decrease in concentration because they form complexes. Okay, so this is the best kind of view of this. So here I have a bunch of silver chloride on the bottom of this, and I'm gonna add in some NH3. So I'm dripping some NH3 in. And what we notice is the NH3 is gonna form these little complexes. By forming these little complexes with the silver, all of a sudden what it has done is it's gonna increase the solubility, okay? So because what's happening is, again, if we look at the equilibrium of this, AgCl solid is in equilibrium with Ag plus and Cl minus. If we are forming this complex, Ag plus is interacting with two NH3s to give me Ag NH3 two aqueous. What we see ultimately is a decrease in the concentration of silver and therefore a shift that way. So it's gonna increase the solubility. And that's what we see. Formation of these things shifts it to the right, almost to the point, well, to the point where we can actually completely dissolve that. So this is simply the addition of any of these two things together is going to give us the complexes, which just reduces the concentration of those. That's the ultimate guide to what's actually happening, okay? All right. And the last little bit, um, I am going to sim skip over the amphoterism. Uh, typically, what we see is both things happening. So aluminum hydroxide is a solid. If you combine it with base, it forms this complex that we just saw, and it's going to increase solubility. Aluminum hydroxide combined with, uh, with H with acid is actually going to form this as a product, and it's, uh, it's essentially also going to dissolve things because it's forming different ions or it's removing acid from, uh, it's removing acid from the reaction. So do the acid-based solutions. So that's an example of amphoterism. Uh, I'm just gonna skip over it because it's basically those same kinds of ideas. Um, yeah. And I think that I will probably get into this in class maybe, but ultimately what it comes down to is selective precipitation is, I can use KSP values to kind of help me uh, selectively dissolve things. So I can selectively get rid of uh, complexes. So here I have, will, what do we expect to actually form? This is gonna be a more complex equilibria, but I think I'll actually just leave it that. I don't think we're gonna talk about selective precipitation, but it's certainly worth looking at. It's how they remediate uh, water. So wastewater, it's certainly worth the look. Okay, so that's it for this. I think that's good, plenty to work with. And that should finish chapter 15 or finish all of that. We've got two thermodynamics and electrochemistry left.